how specific tools uh, and measurements can help to overcome the obstacles and barriers to, to trade faced by women. And also looking at how technology and e-commerce have impacted the economic empowerment of women faced in the world in the advent of COVID-19 and the associated trade disruptions. But equally, exploring the opportunities for rebuilding the global economy with women in international trade at the core. As I have mentioned earlier, we have a very distinguished panel and to give you a very brief overview, and later I will introduce them and their attendant uh, bios. As I've mentioned, we have Ambassador uh, Liera of Mexico, who is a fellow gender champion and ambassador to the United Nations at Geneva. We also have Dr. Amrita Barry from the Instituto Tecnológico Autónomo de México, who is the co-chair of the WTO Chairs Program at that institution and also uh, an attorney. We have Pamela Cook Hamilton, another attorney and director in the, in the Division of International Trade and Commodities at the United Nations Conference for Trade and Development, UNCTAD. We also have joining us Andrea Ewert, who is a customs and international trade attorney at Develop Law, Develop Trade Law, excuse me, in the United States, and a member of the Organization of Women in International Trade. And also joining us, we have Miss Angela Muley, who is from UN Women in Nigeria, and she's also a gender and international development specialist. So as I've said before, we have a very cross-cutting uh, panel for you today. Uh, and at this time, I will give the floor to my colleague and fellow gender champion, Ambassador uh, Liera of Mexico. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Blackman. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. I want to start by thanking Ambassador Blackman for inviting me to co-host this event at the occasion of the fifth anniversary of the International Gender Champions. I congratulate the Secretariat of the Gender Champions for keeping this initiative active and vibrant during these first years of existence, and I am sure that many more years will come ahead. Mexico has a deep belief in the principles and values underpinning the Gender Champions Initiative. We are convinced that gender equality brings benefits at many levels of society and promote peaceful and prosperous societies. A lot of progress has been made towards gender equality in the last years, although we still see resistance to the fundamental transformations that are needed. In order to further gender equality, Mexico launched earlier this year a feminist foreign policy for the first time in our history. The COVID pandemic has transformed our world and deeply affected many areas of our societies and economies including deepening the inequalities that women and girls already face. Women are on the front line of the COVID-19 pandemic, representing 70% of health and social sector workers, in addition to being the primary caregivers at homes and workers in grocery stores and pharmacies. In addition, more women than men work in some of the hardest hit industries, such as retail, hospitality, and tourism. There is an urgent need to ensure that all government actions taken to respond to COVID-19 crisis and in the design of recovery plans are gender responsive. This will help to avoid the rise of new inequalities or the aggravation of those that already exist. For example, in sectors like international trade, I recently saw a study from the International Trade Center indicating that COVID-19 strongly affected 64% of women-led firms compared with 52% of men-led companies. Government need to pay attention to how trade can contribute to women's economic empowerment and to provide adequate support. This can be done at least in three levels. One, exploring how women participate in trade as, as entrepreneurs, traders, or workers. Two, assessing the impact on women on trade adjustment. And three, identifying how women benefit from trade as consumers. This would help shed light on priorities for negotiations in terms of which sectors or reforms may disproportionately affect women positively or negatively 
as well as the domestic policies needed to support opportunities from trade to women. We are very happy to have a panel of excellent experts who will bring their knowledge to this discussion, contributing to promoting equality at all stages of trade. I am looking forward to our discussions. And thank you again, Ambassador Blackman. Over to you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, thank you also very much for setting the scene from the perspective of, of your government. Um, and also, it, I, I know it's a, a priority for the Mexican government, as it is a priority for the government of Barbados. Now, um, we will now get into the, the aspect where we're all uh, waiting for, which really is to treat to the issues and try to unpack within the time that we have um, issues of uh, international trade and women, particularly in the context of COVID-19. At this point in time, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. Amrita Barry, uh, um, a professional um, who has done some leading work in international trade, particularly with the focus of gender uh, and ensuring how do we look and re retool gender from a trade perspective and also trade from a gender perspective. Um, I, I'm sure she will let you know um, about the groundbreaking work that is about to be unveiled later today, incidentally, um, with another international organization. But to give you a bit of background about Dr. Barry, uh, as I mentioned before, she is the co-chair of the WTO chair program uh, of ETAM in Mexico. Uh, she's also the founding chair of the International Trade and Investment Law Research Group uh, as well. And equally, she is the founding member of the South Asian International Economic Law Network. Dr. Barry has a PhD in international trade law from the University of Birmingham, the United Kingdom, and an LLM in international business law from the London School of Economics. So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I give the floor to Dr. Barry. Thank you for this opportunity, His Excellency Ambassador Blackman and Her Excellency Ambassador Flores. So the question I will address during my presentation is, whether and how we can use the existing trade agreements to connect more women to the economy and hence reboot an inclusive economy in the post-COVID-19 world. Next slide, please. Thank you. To address this question, we will first look at how we can measure gender responsiveness of trade agreements using a framework I have developed with ITC. We will then look at the results, the results we got when we applied this framework to over 200 trade agreements. And finally, I will propose eight recommendations that can help prepare the existing and future trade agreements to reduce gender inequality and hence contribute to achieving sustainable development. Next slide, please. Now to begin with, what is gender responsiveness, right? Well, gender responsiveness is the consideration a trade agreement can have towards gender equality concerns. Can we measure it? If yes, how? Well, during the last eight months, working with the ITC's team, we have developed the first ever methodology to try and measure gender responsiveness, gender consideration of trade agreements. Now, this is a maturity framework which helps policymakers measure gender responsiveness of agreements they are negotiating or looking to renegotiate. The questions in this framework try to gauge different ways in which countries incorporate gender provisions, for example, by assessing the frequency, location, nature, and wording of these provisions. After all the questions are answered, the agreement receives a level of, resp level of responsiveness and a score. Next slide, please. So after reviewing some 200 trade agreements signed by 115, 116 countries so far, and measuring their gender responsiveness using this framework, this is what we found. This map gives you a fair idea of countries that include gender commitments in their trade agreements and the ones that don't. Specific things to note here. Number one, the regions that have signed the most gender responsive agreements are North America and East Africa. In fact, East Africa has signed some of the most gender responsive agreements so far with binding legal obligations that's hard to find in other regions. Number two, as you can see, European Union follows the trail, but it still has a long way to go in terms of mainstreaming gender in their trade agreements. They have started the efforts though. 
Number three, different regions have different ways of including these commitments, as you can see on this map. Canada, for example, seeks to use its agreements to enhance women's access to education, finance, and business opportunities. EU, on the other hand, uses its agreements to enhance women's access to health services, reduce violence against women, and protect women's lives in conflict-like situations. And East Africa does it differently. East Africa and the FTAs, the agreements East Africa has signed, seek to enhance women's representation in decision-making and policy-making roles. So gender mainstreaming as such in trade instruments are very diverse and it changes from one region to the other. But there are three things which are common amidst all these agreements. What are these three things? Well, first, most of these agreements include gender commitments as best endeavor promises. So they cannot be enforced. Second, most agreements do not mention or do not create any institutions or procedures to implement these mechanisms, to implement these commitments. And third, the parties do not say in these agreements, do not try and identify how they are going to finance these promises. With no enforcement, no implementation mechanism, and no finance, unfortunately, these promises will always remain promises. Next slide. So how do we ensure that these provisions are put to action for making faster and inclusive recovery post this pandemic? Because women are the mostly the victims as employees, employers, and consumers, as uh, Her Excellency Ambassador Flores pointed out. So how do we ensure that women are placed at the center of trade law policy making in the future? I propose eight recommendations for future trade negotiations. Two of them become most relevant to respond to this pandemic. Number one, policy making needs to focus on enhancing women's access to education, but education that can lead to high paid employment and business opportunities for women. Number two, it needs to enhance women's access to health services and benefits such as maternity allowance and health insurance. We can talk about rest of the recommendations during the following rounds of discussion. Next slide, please. So to conclude, I invite you to think about these three questions. Number one, if highly enforceable labor commitments can be negotiated in agreements such as USMCA, which came into force last week on 1st July, why can't these countries include enforceable gender commitments? Because that is what is missing right now. In almost all trade agreements, we don't have enforceable gender commitments in these agreements. If we can have exceptions to protect animals and plants in almost 95 or even more percent of the existing accords, why can't we negotiate an exception to reduce gender inequality in these trade agreements? And finally, even if gender provisions are not made enforceable because certain countries have reservations to do that, wouldn't they remain a distant reality if parties do not create procedures and institutions or mobilize funds to put these commitments into action? Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Barry, for your uh, opening remarks and your presentation uh, to, to, the, to the panel. Now, at this time, I will go to our second panelist, uh, Ms. Pamela Coke hamilton uh, Ms. Coke hamilton has had a vast and continues to have a very vast experience in international trade, but equally in development policy. And this has been gained through a number of uh, background and experience that she's had um, across the world, particularly in regional, in the Caribbean, and also international organizations, as well as through her national uh, government and universities. She has previously served as the executive director for the Caribbean Export Development Agency, where she led major private sector development initiatives. Before this, uh, she spearheaded the Aid for Trade Initiative for the Caribbean at the Inter-American Development Bank and addressed trade and globalization issues facing small island development states 
at the OAS in Washington, DC. Ms. Cole Hamilton has a Juris Doctor in Law from Georgetown University uh, and a Bachelor's in International Relations and Economics from the University of the West Indies. So, ladies and gentlemen, I now give the floor to Pamela Cole Hamilton from UNCTAD. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassadors. Um, thank you for this opportunity, and Mr. Chairman. Um, I've been asked to look at the context of the post-COVID and the gender impact, and so I wanted to, to focus on that a bit. But I did want to say in, in response to Dr. Barry's very, very, very uh, interesting presentation, and it, it, opens, <laughs> it opens a whole set of issues that we can discuss ad infinitum. And as lawyers, we know how it goes. We could talk all day. But <laughs> I do want to say two things I learned at law school. I didn't learn much, but two things I learned. One, one was that law is a function and, and it, it shocked me at the time because i was young and i was idealistic but that law is a function unfortunately not necessarily of justice but of who holds the power so it is a play that is held by the power players and therefore we have to change the power dynamics in any society in order to change the law the second thing i learned is that bad cases make bad law and sometimes when we seek to follow cases that have already gone through we may follow situations which don't necessarily allow the law to, to work effectively. So we can speak about that in the context of free trade agreements and whether some of the provisions that have been contained therein can actually be explicitly applied uh, to the gender uh, lens. But let me go on to say that in essence, like previous shocks, COVID-19 has not been gender neutral. And I think that is clear just from seeing what has occurred in many of the sectors. We know that for most women, we're involved either in high um, informality. Secondly, that we are much smaller in terms of our business arrangements. Our access to credit is continuously less than that of men. And we can speak about that, but you know, normally what occurs is that women do not have either the access or the information. And one of the issues that we need to address is the systemic absence of transparency for credit for many women in, in, in the field. Most women, um, and given the COVID dynamic, have been the caretakers at home. How has that impacted their ability to engage in the work world and therefore their ability to continue to earn a living? How has that actually, you know, it's funny, when the New York Times start covering something, you know you're in trouble. <laughs> and, and there have been quite a few uh, articles on the women and working from home in this COVID environment and the impact it has had not just on their ability to work the flexible hours, but the increase in the work strain and also their mental health. And so how do we address what has occurred in, in that context? The other thing has been the increase in domestic violence. Uh, the generalized, generalized ratio is that it's 25%, but in some countries, uh, France for one, it, it went up by 45%. And so we need to also look at what has been the impact on women generally in terms of the economics of domestic violence and how it has affected uh, women. So what can we do? Because I, I realize we don't have a lot of time, so I'm trying to go through very quickly. What can we do? I agree we need to include explicit provisions in any recovery plans for the COVID-19. It has to be targeted, it has to be clear, and it has to be explicit. Now this can in involve not just, you know, as you say, best endeavor clauses because we're full of them. But what we need to, <laughs> what we do need to look at is a car vote. Say for example, when there are specific monetary pockets that are, are provided, can there be a carve out specific for women that allows them the access to, let me, let me try to use an analogy here. One of the biggest challenges, for example, the Caribbean has had in accessing donor funds over the years, and that has been my experience. One of the biggest challenges we've had has been the fact that because we are small, because it takes us longer to get access, we lose out not because we don't have good projects, but because we take too long to get there and the money is gone unless there are specific carve outs within some of these agreements that allow those of us who are uh, more capacity constrained to access the funds, we will continuously be on the back foot. And so what I'm saying is that for women, particularly because they're involved in informal sector, because they've been impacted by the 
total decimation of tourism because they have been the ones who've been the primary caretakers. Their ability to access any increased credit scenario is going to be that much less. So we have to provide some kind of provision that allows them to be able to have the time and the capacity to engage the, the funding system. So looking at a carve out, they also need to have mentoring programs. What kind of mentoring programs that can allow women to be able to come in, learn the processes, ensure that they have access to the processes and then can also train going on. So doing a kind of train the trainers program that allows us to continue. How do we retain women's continued productivity in the labor force? Now, if we want to look at the global value chain system, what has occurred in, in the international trade dynamic is that there's been a shortening of global value chains, and that's going to continue for a while. Because, of, because it started in China, a lot of countries have actually started looking at the concept of reshoring, of going back to manufacturing in their own countries, of shortening the value chains. And therefore, this creates opportunities for more women to get involved in the shorter global value chains, to begin looking at, at local production, to see how they can engage uh, more fully in, in a shortened scenario, rather than you know, everything coming from China, we can start to begin to look at what can come out of the region into the United States, into Canada, in other areas. How, how does that work? And how can we um, allow women to take advantage of, of, of this changing dynamic into international trade scenario? Um, MSMEs. There also needs to be a carve out for MSMEs as opposed to just small and medium size. We're looking at micro in my view. Most women are either single or at most family based um, companies or, or, or enterprises. How do we enable MSMEs to actually be able to access and any bailouts should be aimed at the MSMEs first, the really small um, vulnerable uh, enterprises run by women so that they can be able to recover uh, much quicker. And we need to look at that. Um, you mentioned education. I agree. That is critical. Um, improved education, also improved access to social services. I will say something that, that I find particularly amazing here. I've been with the UN now almost two years. And I'm shocked to find that in a, a radius of, I don't know, a couple hundred couple thousand acres or hectares, there's not one crash for young women to leave their children in the UN. Not one. It's the most incredible thing. And so if we're going to talk seriously about women's access and ability to work, how is it that we do not have any capacity within our structure to have women leave their children? Um, so that, that's something that we need to look at seriously. And also the flexible working arrangements. It works and it works well if there are the potential for women to also be able to not lose their minds having to homeschool as well. <laughs> um, because some of us are losing our minds. So, you know, how, how do we address the, the balance in that and how does that work? Um, I'll stop there, but just, just some ideas that I throw out just to see how the conversation can go from here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Director, for your uh, opening remarks and, and contribution to the panel. Now, at this time, we will move to our next panelist, uh, Ms. Andrea Ewart. Uh, as mentioned before, um, Ms. Ewart is the Customs and International Trade Attorney at Developed Trade Law in the United States. Uh, equally, uh, Prior to opening her firm in 2003, she worked in the Washington DC Office of Law of Holland and Knight uh, LLP, where she counseled and represented clients in the United States Customs Law and Enforcement. Uh, equally, she's also an accomplished speaker and writer uh, and applies her practical experience to trade issues that affect businesses and their bottom line. She's also an active member of several uh, professional organizations, including and has served as a former president of the Organization of Women in International Trade and a board member of Women Owned Law. So, ladies and gentlemen, I give the floor to Andrea Ewart. Thank you very much, Ambassador, and my thanks to you, to your co-chair, and to Owit Lake Geneva for this opportunity to participate in this very uh, 
a well-timed panel. So I was asked in this round to address the question of traditional challenges that face women entrepreneurs, SMEs, and these have been elucidated, that are being compounded at this time as sectors are struggling to survive and companies that are facing the task of re-engineering their supply chain, something that um, Pamela just addressed. So how should women entrepreneurs, SMEs, MSMEs be supported to circumvent these challenges and to take advantage of the emerging opportunities? So we know that any crisis, and this is very true in this pandemic as well, creates challenges as well as opportunities. And I would understand the essence of the challenge that I'm being asked to discuss here as this. Do those persons with the vision, with the drive, with the knowledge, the skills, to become the next innovators in whatever sphere they choose, have what they need to attain their goals and vision, to allow them to seize this moment? And how can they be best supported? I think it's one of the tragedies of contemporary societies, this unmet or underserved potential, and we see it so much in the context of women and uh, MSMEs. So I want to po pose the, the most basic scenario of this re-engineering the supply chain, right? A company tries to find alternate suppliers or partners. It's going to be in a new country. Pamela mentioned the situation with, you know, China, folks trying to leave China, or simply because it needs to be more efficient or they want to reduce costs, etc. And the media right now is rife with stories about companies' inability to find alternatives to China, uh, basing their manufacturing in China. So what is the problem is that they're looking for an exact replacement. What if the solution can be found in an innovative approach, an innovative application or a process or a product that's been developed by an SME, MSME or woman entrepreneur? So I would challenge business support organizations and other entities working with these groups, with women entrepreneurs to do the following. One, provide the resources to help these BSOs see possibilities as they are emerging, to be on the cutting edge, to think outside the box. And Pamela did allude to some of this as well, the, the, the um, reshoring, the localization that's happening of global supply chains. But again, how do you incorporate your, your, the clients that you serve, those who have those innovations and cutting edge technologies that could provide uh, workable solutions for these companies as they are re-engineering um, their supply chains? Secondly, position themselves, these organizations, to serve the BSOs that serve these groups, to serve as a point of contact for companies looking for new, to find new suppliers. When a company went to Vietnam or it comes to the Caribbean or whatever, who is it talking to? Are they talking with those organizations that have that direct contact with, with uh, these uh, smaller companies that, as I said, could have just the solution that they need? Thirdly, be prepared to educate these companies that are seeking new partnerships, new suppliers, to educate them on the advantage of working with newer companies that may be more agile, maybe thirstier, and yes, possibly cheaper if that's what it takes. In a related sense, help your clients, the women, the MSMEs, SMEs, to be able to estimate and talk about the bottom line, which is always, always going to be key. Uh, how will their innovation, their solution, help that company to meet or exceed its financial goals? And then finally, the trade war with China is not going anywhere. This, uh, even as, as the pandemic ends, we know the pandemic was preceded by uh, the, the, a number of the challenges being uh, highlighted in the context of facing manufacturer in China. And that is going to continue beyond the pandemic. And so the need for these discussions will continue beyond the pandemic. 
So it's really, really important right now to start building the relationship that will facilitate these important discussions as we go forward. I'll stop there and look forward to questions and continued engagement. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Ms. Ewart, for your presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now move to our final panelist, and thereafter, we will then uh, go to our discussion, and thereafter, we will have uh, questions and answers for you. Now, I'm going to introduce to you Angela Miri uh, of UN Women in Nigeria. Uh, Ms. Muley holds a Bachelor of Science of, in Biomedical Sciences from the University of Essex in the United Kingdom and a Master of Science in Global Health and Development from the University College of London. Prior to joining the UN Women Country Office in Nigeria, she led on design and implementation of transformative young women's leadership programs aimed at in ending gender-based violence across East Africa and the United Kingdom with the Foundation for Women's Health and Research Development. Equally, she's passionate about young women's leadership and advocacy in STEM and sustainable development. Currently, she works within the women's leadership and political participation thematic area at the UN Women Nigeria Country Office. Ladies and gentlemen, I give the floor to Angela Yuli. Honorable Excellencies, distinguished members of the panel and guests joining online. Firstly, just want to express deep gratitude to Ambassadors Liera and Blackman for hosting this webinar on the fifth anniversary of the International Gender Champions. So UN Women is the United Nations entity for gender equality and the empowerment of women. And so this year marks the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action. Um, it's also 10 years since the establishment of UN Women by the United Nations General Assembly. And so I think we have a, a very unique opportunity to take these overlapping moments and use them as a springboard to further our mutual agenda on gender equality. So I just want to quickly um, speak on how agricultural sectors can, um, can leverage existing supply chains to empower West African women who are disproportionately represented in these sectors, but have limited access to property and profits. So it's ironic, as some of um, the panelists have already alluded to, it's ironic that in crisis and recovery, the pursuit of gender equality takes a back seat. And yet we know that gender equality is critical for robust and resilient economic markets. Um, according to the Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development here in Nigeria, Women make up approximately 75% of the agricultural workforce, working predominantly as farm managers and providers of labor. However, in 2020, women only made up 13% of sole or joint owners of land. Um, and during the COVID pandemic, women in the agricultural sector who already have limited access to resources have been adversely affected by government lockdown directives. Women farmers are losing out on sales of produce due to restrictions on travel. And this has had subsequent impl implications on maintenance of processing machines, for example, in Southeast Nigeria, where women cooperatives who usually cultivate cassava to be processed into gari flour don't actually have the money for machine upkeep. So bearing in mind that Nigeria is the largest producer of cassava in the world, and yet only contributes to 1% of cassava exports globally, we have really not lived up to our vast potential. Um, and furthermore, the reality of inflated prices in markets due to COVID-19 has reduced access to seedlings and stems for farming, making this an even more damning situation for Nigeria and its women farmers. So the UN Women um, Nigeria Country Office in partnership with FAO, ILO and UNIDO currently have a fla flagship program initiative titled More Rural Women Secure Access to Productive Resources and Engage in Sustainable Agribusiness, which targets the economic empowerment of women with a focus on enhancing women's small scale farmers' security to productive resources and engagement in sustainable agribusiness. So this, pro um, this program speaks directly to the challenges of property ownership by emphasizing women's 
access to land as opposed to ownership of land, because generally land ownership is viewed by custom and tradition as a more masculine preserve. Um, however, the anecdotal evidence that we've seen suggests that it's easier for women to access women's um, to access land for agricultural activities from local authorities based on requests. So this program actually clarifies that there's no necessary, not necessarily a contest for ownership, um, even though that's contentious, but rather a request for land to be used for farming purposes over a designated time. So moreover, this program target um, is to combine support for cash production, including but not limited to cassava, rice, the shea nut, with support for complementary enterprise. And the complementary enterprise model refers to the activities that are undertaken between during the break between planting and harvesting um, in cases where the gap between these stages is actually prolonged. So I say all of this to highlight the fact that whilst the program model was developed before the COVID pandemic, the concept of um, complementary enterprise is extremely important to the current situation. And UN women in Nigeria and across sub-Saharan Africa are retraining program participants and partners in other vocational skills, including soap, hand sanitizer production, supply of protective gear, which actually does meet the current consumer demand. And this is a similar approach that we've seen to the International Trade Center's She Trades West Africa project. Um, so for women's empowerment programs within the agricultural sector to yield the desired results, governments must implement gender sensitive policies. And as Dr. Bari um, spoke on earlier, they have to actually have a provision for how they're going to implement these policies. In Nigeria, for instance, the national gender policy in agriculture highlights the fact that Gender equality in access to resources, as well as equal opportunities in maximizing means of livelihood, is actually a necessary condition for progressively realizing the SDGs for which we only have 10 more years. So I would just like to end this point on um, saying the implementation of these policies should therefore reduce the vulnerability of women to biases in um, agriculture and improve the contributions of women farmers who make up most of the workers in the sector but yet still have low agricultural um, assets. And I would say that accountability toward implementation of policy is important and the resilience of this ec ecosystem will greatly determine how future trade flows and how the role of um, small enterprises in, in international trade will be capitalized on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Muley, for your uh, remarks and, and contribution. Now, we would have all heard the, the panelists give their, their remarks and their perspectives. And at this time, we're going to then have begin the, the dialogue. And first, let me therefore go to our first panelist, Dr. Barry. Uh, Dr. Barry, you would have mentioned the whole aspect of the enforceability gap. Um, there are many agreements to which uh, countries are party to, um, but there has hitherto not necessarily been a very tangible way to, to have these things implemented. Um, you've mentioned uh, the whole aspect of best endeavor. Uh, Director Cole Hamilton has also alluded to it. But the question, therefore, I have for you is how do we get governments, by and large, because they're the ones who have to uh, implement these things, how do you, uh, or how do we, rather, get governments to move from the best endeavor into a very tangible, enforceable way of uh, ensuring that these things are, are, able, are able to um, be implemented. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, so you're absolutely right. The problem right now is, and that's why I think this pandemic provides us an opportunity to address this crisis as well as this gender inequality concern. Because with this pandemic, the gender equality concerns are at the risk of taking a back seat. They can go back um, in the minds of future policy making as countries are now focusing on urgent issues. They have urgent issues to deal with. So it is really important that we don't lose the sight because if we lose the sight of this gender equality concern right now, um, the progress we have made in this respect in the last few decades is at the risk of being rolled back. So, how do we ensure that we don't lose the sight? We, the, the way to ensure that we don't lose the sight um, is by placing women at the center of policy making, as that would ensure not just addressing a social or a moral cause, but also making faster and inclusive recovery. 
because gender equality is no longer a social or a moral case. It is now a very strong business case. So if countries cannot buy it as a social case, they need to buy it as a business case. And studies from uh, World Bank, McKinsey, ILO, UN have proved that women equality and women empowerment is now a very strong business case. And we need it more now, more than ever, in fact. So how do we use the agreements? First of all, can they help? Yes, they can certainly help. And we are all on the same page on this. How do we ensure that they help in this process? The most important thing is enforcement. We need to start drafting these gender commitments in the trade agreements in legally binding obligation style and no longer in beautifully framed promises because that doesn't work, especially when there is no mechanism to implement them. How do we ensure implementation? We can only ensure implementation if there are institutions and procedures to implement these promises. How, what kind of procedures or institutions I'm talking about? In terms of institutions, I think countries need to assign national contact points or they need to create a central institution um, in the form of a council or a committee that can ensure the implementation as well as the monitoring of the, uh, of the implementation of these promises. And finally, the most important in this, in this respect is finance. Countries need to start thinking as to how they can mobilize resources to finance these gender promises and gender actions that they are undertaking very proudly in the agreements. Because if they don't find the money to do it, they would always remain there um, as promises and they would never be brought to action. So we need to bring them to action. For that, we need enforcement, implementation, and finance. Enforcement, implementation, and finance. I couldn't agree with you more. And, and then the question therefore has to be is, how, how soon? I think it's a conversation that really has to, to, to be had, particularly when we are looking at, um, for example, MC12 coming up next year. I think these are things that countries should begin to, to explore if they haven't already done so in a very formal way. Thank you very much for that. Uh, now, I'm going to head to Director uh, Hamilton. Director, you would have mentioned the issue of um, the need for carvals, particularly for um, groups that need it, whether it be smaller uh, clusters of economies and also in this context, uh, women, okay? Now, given that you're in a, a very uh, important institution, UNCTAD, which serves as the UN's uh, body that treats to trade and development, how do we get the, the rest of the multilateral system to see this not just as a, a standalone issue, but streamlined across the entire multilateral platform, particularly in circumstances where many of the institutions are not as gender focused or trade aware as they ought to be. Um, thank you, Vice Ambassador. That's a, that's a very incisive question, as usual. I think one of the things I was thinking when Dr. Barry was speaking is that one of the things I've learned over the years is simply this: that. The most effective way to change a scenario is for people to acknowledge that there's actually a problem. And I think fundamentally one of the challenges we have is that many, many, many country leaders do not think that there's a problem. And if they think it's a problem, they don't think it's a really major problem. You know, women just complaining all the time, you know. So the first thing we have to do is to address the elephant in the room. Let me give you an example. When I was trying to introduce a few years ago, before I left Caribbean Export, a, a woman in export program, the biggest, biggest pushback I got was from my male members of staff who did not believe that, that the Caribbean had a woman issue. And it was not until I could point out to them from personal experience that if I were to try to take my son out of Barbados, I had to get a letter from his father to give me permission to take my child out of Barbados, even though his father didn't live there. So <laughs> the, the point I'm making is that there are systemic built-in issues that most men who actually make these agreements are not aware of and how they affect women. So I think one of the first things we need to begin to do is to really in very concrete terms, point out the legal issues that women who need to access finance in many countries, if you don't have land, you can't access finance. You have no collateral. If you have no collateral, you can't get money. 
You don't own land because the country says you can't own land. So how are you going? You know, it, it's, it, these are systemic vested issues. We have to address them at the granular level. If we do not do that, everything else we're doing is nice and pretty and we take good photoshops and we tweet. But the point is we need to get to the granular and that, that is where I would like us to go. So that's my comment for now. I see you laughing, but you know, that's where I think we need to go. No, no, I, I, <laughs> to, to the contrary, I'm not laughing. I'm actually smiling in support of what you're saying because you couldn't have put it any, any other way. And speaking now in my own personal capacity here, I think what you just said highlighted the fact that there needs to be more uh, gender champions, not just formally, but men ought to be involved. In, in these things and being aware of the issues. Because as you said, um, across the world, our parliaments and congresses are by and large, we're making progress gradually, but they're pretty much dominated by men who many times are not aware um, of the sensitivities of these things. So there, there's a huge need uh, for that. Um, and I, I, am, I, I can say to you um, that over the coming months, more discussions like these, but not only the discussions, because you can have lots of discussions and then we have no traction. We have to now use these mechanisms and these discussions to take it from discussion into reality through the system. Uh, because I can tell you, I have a daughter and I don't want my daughter to grow up in a world that's not gender sensitive because it's purely by virtue that she is uh, a, a young lady. So there has to be a very clear um, way forward and men has, have to see the importance of this. Um, and I, I could not agree with you more. I could not agree with you more. Now, I, I'm going to move uh, quite briefly to Ms. Ewart. Now, you would have looked at the whole issue of um, having resources at, at the disposal of women and, and businesses who are involved uh, and everything. And you also mentioned about um, perhaps providing these resources. But the question is, in providing these resources, is it going to be done on an incentive base? Are we going to ask uh, governments and the other private sectors to be driven by incentives? Or going back to what Dr. Barry would have mentioned, is it based on a stronger model, um, seeing that um, th there is a, a business case to be made uh, for women to be formally involved in a lot of these things, and therefore resources has to be put um, at the, the disposal of small, medium enterprises and even micro enterprises um, to ensure that the participation uh, of women uh, is, is further advanced. Right. So I don't think those two things are mutually exclusive at all. Um, the, there are others on this panel that are better positioned to speak to the and work at the policy level on these issues. In my work as a, as a trade uh, customs and trade attorney looking at issues around trade facilitation etc i tend to address i work with business support organizations with uh chambers of commerce with you know organizations that are are there to provide resources and support and advocate on behalf of of um you know their, their clients and so from that in that context I could see a couple of bo both approaches that you mentioned being very valid. I think organizations, governments, I'm sorry, need to uh, devote more resources to these organizations if they are truly going to live up to their commitment to, um, you know, gender equality to the extent those commitments exist. And where it doesn't, I will leave that to the policymakers and the advocates to, 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 to address that gap. But in the context of the, uh, those organizations that work directly with uh, your importers, your exporters, your traders, your wannabe uh, importers and exporters, et cetera, provide that funding to these, uh, to these organizations. And, these organizations in turn need to better position themselves to um, identify and position those those members, those clients that they have that are ready to to move to the to the next level. You know, I think this is an approach that's used, for instance, by um, uh, 
name's escaping me right now. But so she trades, ITC she trades with uh, Women's International, et cetera. It's always about providing opportunities for those women that are ready to move to the next level. And in this particular situation where there's a crisis, the opportunity that it creates, there is just so much room for innovation. Those, it's the innovators who are going to, I think, provide the solutions, who are going to help to drive the change that's needed to respond in this time of crisis. And I think actively and consciously recognizing that and being prepared to direct resources towards those uh, groups, I think, will both help us to get fast, to move fast, out of the crisis and also advance the broader cause that we're talking about today, which is that of gender equality. Thank, thank you very much for, for, for those words, uh, just not treating to the issue. Now, quite briefly, um, and then we open it up to, to the wider uh, audience uh, as well. Uh, Angelo, you would have looked at the whole issue of women heavily involved in the informal sectors. And therefore, the question I have, and I've seen a report quite recently, where particularly even before COVID-19 had, had taken place, uh, and it's even a bit more so now, a lot of women across the world, whether it be the Caribbean, Africa, uh, Europe, the Pacific, are engaged in the informal sectors. But the report said, and quite poignantly so, that if we had to take the number of women who are involved in the informal sector globally, and I think Director, I think Director Hamilton, uh, Hamilton, I think it was you who quoted that in a meeting, actually. Yes. It, it was actually said, basically, invariably, that if we had to take the informal sector of women across the world, we could have another two or three global economies if they were now brought into the mainstream global economy. So the question, therefore, is how do we get that um, brought to, to the fore? In circumstances where there's a significant decline in growth in, in the global economy, um, trade and services has declined as a result of COVID-19, but how do we get our, our women into the formal sector and also the capacity building to do so? Um, because the, the global economy is moving along in terms of technology, uh, new areas of artificial intelligence, uh, et cetera, in a more sophisticated way. But how do we get our informal sector involved in the global uh, mainstream, and this provides tremendous opportunities. Yes, um, that's completely correct. And I think it's important that when we're also looking at how do we um, get women into the more formalized sectors that we actually recognize some of the um, inequalities and the risks that they face at the moment so that we ensure that whilst we are in a pandemic crisis, um, that we're not leaving these women behind, that they're not falling behind on our agenda. So that means that we need to recognize, especially um, in the context of Nigeria, where um, the, a lot of women within the informal sector um, are also cross, uh, cross-border traders, uh, understanding that they have been even more disproportionately affected by lack of income. This has opened up opportunity for increased cases of violence, sexual, um, sexual exploitation, trafficking. And in fact, indeed, Nigeria recently announced a state of emergency on GBV, and we know this is likely to increase. So the general answer, I guess, is, um, is policy making, holistic policy making. Um, but in terms of specifically looking at um, trade and um, international development in that sense, um, when we're looking to build back better, we need to be looking um, at closer collaboration and coordination among um, institutions such as ECOWAS to synergize their efforts and those of member states in assisting small businesses in particular to ensure um, a fair and safe business environment with particular emphasis on women traders. Um, as with everything, the COVID-19 pandemic has shone a light on the vast cases of gender inequality, and this is actually also reflected in the lack of gender dis disaggregated data. So when we talk about creating a business case as well for gender equality, we need, um, we need evidence. So it's important um, that we not only do rapid gender impact assessments, but long term, we do look at inc um, increased access to information. That not only includes um, trade rules, explanation of protocols, market information, but also looking at um, education for, for young girls. 
um, and also looking at how do we provide clearer, simplified documents in national languages as well that actually promote the benefits of moving toward the, um, the formal sector. It also means increased access to social, to social and business networks, um, increased access to better infrastructure with adequate shelter, roads, toilets, water um, and sewage facilities which enable women to in the interim carry on doing the work that they're doing but also eventually um, seeing how we can sort of segue into the into the formal sector. But I just briefly want to mention as well, so outside um, informal trade, we're, we're going to have to start looking at who's going to be making these policies in the future. Um, and that's, it's critical then that we invest in young women in particular um, to ensure that they are, they are in positions where they can um, make impactful policies, where they can mainstream gender in the um, organizations that they lead. So just to leave it by saying that, you know, young women cannot be what they can't see. So that means that when we're talking about education, as Dr. Bari said, we need to be looking at um, education that's going to allow them access to senior level positions within global development, within international development. And so I would really implore um, all the leaders within this space right now to look at how they can also introduce um, measures that allow young women to um, shadow other female leaders um, and to, to gain experience, to gain exposure, which is vital for them to access these senior level positions where they can enact the change that they want to see. Thank you very much uh, for, for, for those words. Now, I must say I have I've received, um, and they're still coming in, a lot of questions from our participants who are online. And I suspect that we may have to have another meeting given the number of questions we have to facilitate them. But I, I want to put this question first to Ambassador uh, Liera and, and to all the panelists here. Um, the, the question I have, and I'll set it out and then you, you can have a go. Now, uh, consulting opportunities have been canceled and programming uh, priorities shifted because of uh, social distancing requirements, travel bans, uncertainty of safety of travel, uh, the risk of a second wave, parental obligations and travel bubbles. However, there is scope to convert field of activity to remote ones. So the question is, could international organizations, business uh, organizations and other entities commit to a program of uh, deliberately reviewing programming of contract work uh, and converting contract opportunities to remote contracts? In some cases, uh, travel budgets could be shifted to increasing uh, work uh, that uh, has an effort, for example, online consultations, uh, and it could take more time to focus on groups. So, quite broadly, the question again is, could international organizations and business organizations uh, and other entities commit to a program of deliberately reviewing programming of contract work and con uh, converting contract opportunities into remote contracts? So. Um, Ambassador, uh, I'll let you have the first go at that one and then open it to uh, the panel, uh, should you want to, to jump in on that one. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. That's a, that's a very important question because I, I think what we have been discussing, and I think it's very clear that we have to think on women responses for the programs of recovery. And that includes on not only the contracting, but in order to be able to support women going into the into the digital world we need to empower them and i think we have to we have to see that there is a huge digital gender gap i think this is the result of lack of access to the digital space and technology and there is a lot of potential if all uh, the system the un system and all organizations would really think about delivering as one but we have to create new models new models that can be that can be can provide flexibility to participation of women in several activities, including trade, uh, access uh, to new markets for employment, and support. Because I think that many of the, of the comments that were made is that it's not only that you give the access to women to the technologies, for example, you also need to provide them for support so they can, uh, and they can be ready to use that. And, and as was mentioned by some of the, of the participants, Sometimes uh, women have a lot of duties in themselves, in support, in the house, in taking care of the children. Now, uh, homeschooling, 
that uh, sometimes it's also very difficult for them to, 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 eat, to, uh, to be present at several activities at the same time. So my point is that it, this is a multidimensional issue that needs to be addressed at different components. I, I am convinced that we have, if we want to, to enable women to participate more in the digital work, they must have more and better access to the internet. Uh, they, we have to improve also IT and financial infrastructure and identify uh, em enabling environments to, uh, to, to allow women to engage in new economic activities. Uh, and I think as, as was said by also other the panelists, we need to educate better, we need to empower women, and we have also to educate men because they are also a very important part of the equation. Back to you, uh, Ambassador. Thank, thank you very much, Ambassador. So I, I'd open the floor to the rest of the panelists should they want to on this particular question. Do we have any takers? Yes, as, as someone who operates as a consultant as well, I do think that the, the, um, the, the specific question that was posed in, uh, about opening up um, more consulting opportunities or integrating more online um, mechanism through consulting, I would I would agree that it, it it makes a lot of sense. I've started to see this in the Caribbean, where you know a huge part of costs around the Caribbean, especially if you're doing regional work, was you know travel from one island to the next, one country to the next, because it's more than islands. And I've increasingly seen the use of video conferencing to um, facilitate that. And so I think um, I also find myself doing a lot more home-based work with perhaps just a visit in and perhaps even the visit in can be facilitated by you know video conferencing so uh, particularly in we should not let the need to stay safe during this pandemic stop the need for the very important development work that needs to continue and so moving it into uh and incorporating uh possibilities and opportunities for remote work, I think, is absolutely a solution. Thank you. Do we have any other takers on this one? Um, um, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Dr. Bai. Okay. Thank you, Pamela. Sure. Just to, uh, just to um, uh, uh, try and uh, explore a bit more on um, what Ambassador uh, Flores Lera said. So um, yes, it is absolutely important that when we are talking about enhancing women's access to education, there are two things which are fundamental today. One, we focus on educational opportunities that can lead to high paid employment and business opportunities for women. Because it is true, almost all trade agreements that talk about women's access to education, they talk about women's access to basic and traditional education in sectors which are very poorly paid and have really poor working conditions. For example, farming, fisheries, and so on and so forth. So we need to change that trend. And second, we need to bridge the digital divide between men and women. It is absolutely fundamental more so today because the education has gone online. All the educational institutions, universities, schools are in an online mode. All, all the courses are running online. So we need to provide sophistication and access to internet and technology to women. And we also need to do that, we need to bridge uh, digital divide that we have been making progress on for some time, but the progress has been quite slow, slow and painful. We need to do that because now we are moving towards digital trade. And if you want women to benefit from digital trade and digital commerce, we need them to be sophisticated uh, to internet and technology. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, sorry, uh, Director Cole Hamilton, followed by uh, Angela, please. Um, just just uh, actually a quick thing. I was just going to agree with um, Amrita about the whole issue of the digital divide. We can talk about e-commerce and we talk about access to, you know, the e-commerce framework and market. But if women do not have the capacity to actually engage in the e-commerce framework because they don't have access to the digital, it doesn't make any sense. It, it sounds nice on paper, but in effect, we don't have the penetration rates that are required. If you look at most of Africa, the penetration rate in Africa is less than 25%. It doesn't make any sense. In most least developed countries who are most vulnerable, the penetration rate is 
So we cannot seriously talk about, you know, empowering women when the penetration rate for the actual access to the digital economy does not exist. And so these are the kind of bridges that we need to draw. You know, we say one thing, but in order to do it, we have to put in place the mechanisms to make it happen. Um, the second point I wanted to make was about the whole government procurement rules. I think more countries need to look at their government procurement mechanisms at the national level. Before we even start talking about international contracting, let's talk about how women can access the, the government procurement that's out there that's billions of dollars in every country that tends to either be earmarked or skewed in a particular way um, and women don't have access. I, I think that is an area. You look at contracting, you know, look at road works, you look at all the various aspects in government procurement. You never see women getting those contracts. Why? And I think that is a, a very low hanging fruit that we should begin to look at. So those are just my two points, thanks. Thank you very much. Andrew? Yes, just a quick one. I think there also needs to be um, uh, concerted efforts for donors as well to change their funding priorities at the moment and um, increase the flexibility of what they are funding, allowing allocation for, um, for programming that focuses on women who are disproportionately affected so that we're not doing, oh, it's just business as usual and we have to um, uh, you know, attain certain goals, but if there is a need to do affirmative, and there is always a need to do affirmative procurement from women businesses in order to produce palliatives for, um, for vulnerable women, just as we're doing right now in Nigeria with the Federal Ministry of Women's Affairs, then that's what we should be doing. And if there's a need to look at gender-based violence, because there's been soaring cases of gender-based violence, then I definitely think that um, donors need to be flexible and open to that. Thank you. Now, as I said, we have a lot of uh, participants online, a very, very high number, uh, both on this platform and, and otherwise. Um, and one of those persons, uh, incidentally, and I've now seen uh, a very poignant comment, is from Barbados. Uh, we have Professor uh, Eileen Barito, who is the principal of the KFL campus of the University of West Indies. And she made a very um, short but very poignant point that one of the things, or perhaps the elephant in the room is, and this is to all of us here to, to have a go at it, is that we, we can speak about, for example, the enforceability issues and everything, but the elephant in the room is the whole aspect of the inequality of the system itself. And how do we then expose it for what it is? Um, we've obviously spoke about the issue of parliaments, we've spoken about the issue of the mindsets and everything, but invariably, unless there can be a very clear um, call to arms, as it were, and I use those words very carefully, um, treating to the issue, I, I too have this view um, in my own personal capacity, um, we will be spinning top and mud perhaps if, if we have this discussion in another 5, 10, 15 years. So therefore, the question is, what do we do in very tangible terms? I mean, we, we, know, we know the broad strokes, we know the um, broad thematic areas that we want to, to, to treat to these things, but how do we get this done in a very short time, in a very clear, comprehensive manner, that allows, as, as she said, to call it for what it is and to remove the systemic challenges at the core of the issue. Um, so I, I would like to start, if we could, uh, with Director Hamilton, and then we would go from there. Oh, thanks, Ambassador. Well, you know, once again, uh, Professor Barito has <laughs> completely blown everything out because she's called it what it is. Uh, we were trying to be diplomatic around it. But yes, the system is designed in a way that is, is fundamentally unequal. And, and, unless, and it's why I alluded to the whole issue of the fact that the power structure is what makes law. And unless you change the power structure, the laws don't change. And so laws reinforce the power dynamic that continuously exists. So when you, you fiddle with the laws, you're really only fiddling with the result of the power dynamic, not the other way around. So I think there are a couple of things that I would suggest. One has to do with, at a granular level, I believe in evidence. We need to chart the evidence of the systemic, just like systemic racism, we need to chart the evidence of systemic um, discrimination against women that are embedded in the laws of all these lands and across the board, one. 
We then need to propose how we break it down step by step, what needs to be done and how these can be changed. Some can be changed very easily and very quickly. Some will be more transient because they, they, they retain a power structure that people want. But I think we need to, to, to be more strategic and also um, tactical in, in how we begin to break down the dynamic that currently exists. The constant talking about it and the nice conferences and so on is not going to change anything. We have to become granular, we have to become specific, and we have to start attacking the very base of the systemic issue, because that's what it is. Just my proposal. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Let me have some remarks to that from uh, uh, Ms. Ewart, followed by Dr. Berry and Angela. Thank you, Ambassador. I absolutely agree with the need to address the power disparity that exists. And um, building on Pamela's idea about charting, identifying what, what are the legal obstacles, et cetera, and you know, identifying those. I think that takes us to the whole question of actually getting the laws passed and then enforcing it, which is why I do think we need to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. I think we've got to address the policy piece, but we've also, I never thought I'd be taking this. I mean, there is also, um, you know, something to be said for incremental change. I mean, when you look at countries that are focusing on things like making sure that you get more women elected in, in, in you know, to, to office, and you see the impact of having more women elected into the, in, in, you know, at, because they can advocate, they, they push these things. Um, so I think, um, Attacking it at the big level, but I think a lot of the sort of incremental things that we've been talking about are equally important and we just need to address it from all levels because it is a, it is a major issue. It is absolutely important and crucial for achieving, the, you know, for countries achieving their, their fullest potential because if you don't allow everyone, everyone in the society, equal access, equal ability to achieve their potential, as I alluded to earlier, this sort of, I think it's one of the biggest tragedies that we have in this world today, unmet potential. And so uh, it is a huge problem and it just needs to be attacked on multi fronts. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Dr. Mary, followed by Ms. Mirley. Thank you, Ambassador. So, so yes, so the real question is how do we address the elephant in the room? Um, and um, there are two responses. One, I think it is important to go to the root cause as uh, Director ha Hamilton rightly pointed out. So many countries deny that there is a problem and other countries that don't deny that there is a problem uh, deny including gender commitments because they believe that trade instruments are meant for trade transactions and no, not for social issues. So I think what we really need to enhance is awareness and understanding on these issues. We need to enhance awareness on how trade and gender connects, how they're interrelated, how they're inseparable, and how one affects the other. We can do that by creating tools and methodology. UN has created a tool on trade and gender to assess the impact of trade agreements, which is very useful and very impressive. Now there is this new tool to measure gender responsiveness of trade agreements. So it is really important that future researchers carry on creating tools to enhance understanding and awareness of policymakers and trade negotiators in this respect. Number two, um, what are the most important provisions that are a must have in future trade agreements? One, we need to have provisions that can break the legal barriers uh, Director Hamilton was mentioning a while ago legal barriers and enhance access to productive resources because not having productive resources is a vicious circle. Many women in the world, especially in developing countries, don't have access to a simple bank account. If they don't have a bank account, 
They don't have a financial history. They don't have a financial history. They don't have credit worthiness. They don't have credit worthiness and no assets and no access to productive resources. They cannot apply for capital to start a business or revive their business if they have had to scale down their operations during the pandemic. Number two, access to education and to also address very importantly, digital gap that Ambassador Flores pointed out. And finally, an exception, an exception which is focused on gender. When we can have exceptions in almost all trade agreements designed on Article 20, Article 20 basically seeks to protect public models, animals' health and life, plants' health and life, we can definitely try and think about having an exception to reduce gender inequality. And it would be needed more so now than ever. Why? Because in this uncertain environment, many gov governments would want to extend state aid, subsidies, bailout program to industries to revive the industries and to protect, the, uh, protect those industries. And doing this would go against the obligations these countries have taken under WTO agreements and many regional trade agreements. So maybe now is the time to think about a gender exception. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Miriam. Thanks, Ambassador. So um, I just really like what um, Director spoke about in terms of where power holds, where, where power is held. Um, and who holds power. And I think sometimes when we're in these um, fora, it becomes something of speaking to the converted, already converted. But I think that's still very useful because if we're speaking to the converted who happen to be in positions of power, then we have a very, um, we, have a, we have an entry point. So when we speak, speak on future economies and gender sensitive trade, we should really be asking questions on the current decision making power of um, young black and brown women, women living with disabilities, women from LGBTQI plus communities, and also women from middle and low, um, low income countries within trade. And if these women are in positions of power, so not just talking about representation, but do they also have the structures that promote and protect their leadership and participation. So which goes back to what I was mentioning about you cannot be what you cannot see. And, and I would like to draw links with the International Gender Champion um, Network's commitment on representation and women in leadership. And I think mainstreaming gender um, in practical terms also looks at you know the, the role of male allies. So for example, opting to only engage in panels and events where female experts are leading and contributing or for example, um, nominating female colleagues to speak. Um, this is, these are significant forms of allyship. And whilst they may be small, I think they can um, play a huge role in actually increasing the number of women who are um, visible, but also who um, have a secure platform from which to implement the policies that we are speaking about. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Now, let, let me say uh, at the onset here, um, I'm acutely aware um, that we have passed the time that we've advertised for this. Um, but based on, on what I'm seeing online, I, I'm craving your indulgence to perhaps go for five to 10 minutes more um, because a lot of questions are coming in. Um, and I think that it's something that we should treat to. Um, so if that's everyone is okay with that, we will go for a few more minutes. We'll take one more round um, of questions, and then we will have a closing set of uh, remarks after that, and then we would conclude. Now, the, the question, therefore, one coming in directly to Dr. Barry, and obviously, as I said, it's also open to everyone, okay? Now, many uh, free trade agreements contain highly enforceable labor commitments. If this can be negotiated, why are countries still reluctant to include enforceable gender related commitments such as equal pay for equal work. Absolutely. So I think um, I, I, I would, instead of responding to your question, I would join in to ask this question uh, to the policymakers in this, in this session. Um, I think acceptance is most important. And as Director Hamilton said, we need to identify where the power is based and we need to convince those decision makers. Uh, we need to change the, the, the scene at the decision-making level. How can we do that? We either need to convince the decision-makers, maker, which mostly all over the world are men on an average, or uh, we need to uh, have more women as decision-makers. So if we want to have trade policy making more inclusive, if you want trade policy and trade agreements to create inclusive economy, let everyone participate, 
and negotiate uh, together, men as well as women. And uh, we go in stages. There was a time when the incorporation of provisions on human rights, climate change, and environment were dearly uh, uh, opposed and resisted by the countries. And um, there was a time when countries did not believe in international law, even public international law. That has been accepted. So perhaps it's time to look at the business case of gender equality and accept that. Countries have their fears. They have their hesitations. Hesitations are reasoned and they are well logical. But we need to go beyond those hesitations and look at the numbers that are speaking out loud. Thank you very much. Any other panelists wanting to treat to, to that specific question? Can we get some remarks from, uh, for example, Ms. Ewart? <laughs> okay, you're putting me <laughs> on the spot here. <laughs> well, you know, I'm not going to address this specific labor mm -hmm. enforcement thing, but what I will do is, is, is I, I, as, uh, listening to um, you know, Amita's comments, and I'm out of the diplomatic world, so I'm being very informal here. So uh, forgive me if I'm violating any protocol. But um, you mentioned in talking about the tool that you that has been devised to look at, um, you know, the gender responsiveness of trade agreements. And as someone who works specifically in the area of customs and trade and trade facilitation, I can tell you that the WTO's trade facilitation agreement. I don't know if you looked at it, but I, it does not, I tried doing a search through the document. It does not mention woman, it doesn't mention gender. I mean, there's just absolutely nothing in there about it. So what do we do in that context? We, to say we're going to invest the effort and the time to go back and try to renegotiate, um, you know, a trade agreement, I don't think is realistic. And I don't think we, I don't think we should wait or should have to wait. So what I think we need to look at how can we be, how can this huge lack, this huge gap be addressed in the process of implementation as well? So I think things like, um, you know, there's the chapter to article 10, which looks at, um, you know, the, the need for countries to reform their entry, their clearance procedures, and they're going to be pulling together um, identifying where there are gaps and where they need to improve. Goodness, adapt a gender analysis to this process, right? Make sure that in your consultative processes, you incorporate women. And as was alluded to earlier, the significant number of women involved in trade are actually informal traders, which means that a lot of the, of the, of the information in there, a lot of the provisions aren't going to relate to them. So how then are there additional um, steps that need to be taken to make these entry and clearance procedures simpler, more transparent, um, you know, take into account perhaps the, the gap in digital access to, uh, you know, digital, um, you know, uh, uh, digital access to digital tools, et cetera, that Ambassador Flores mentioned. So I think these are some of the ways that we have to, as I mentioned earlier, both be looking at the high level policy issues, but as we're moving ahead and implementing, I think there are, there is low hanging fruit and opportunities to integrate uh, and address that huge gap that exists in existing uh, trade agreements. Um, Ambassador, one of the things that we've done, and I wanted to point out, the gender unit at UNCTAD has actually created a methodology for an ex-ante assessment of the potential impacts of trade agreements um, on women, and that has been adopted by a few countries. Um, it now be, what it should become is the norm. It, it should now be you know, something that becomes an automatic part of any trade agreement that's being negotiated, so that there's an ex-ante assessment and allows us to look at it before it actually even comes into force. Rather than trying to fix it ex post, we do it ex ante. So I think that, that that's one area that I think should be very important. We've also done some regional studies that go granular and try to look at solutions at the granular level. Those are things that we can also make available. But I think fundamentally, when, when, we're, when we're working on this um, scenario, we need to be aware that 
not just the negotiators. I understand the EU Commission is using it in their negotiations, but also the countries who are negotiating need to be aware of what their interests are from a gender perspective in incorporating certain measures within an agreement. Um, because if we don't, then it becomes a one-way stream. So I think that needs to be a, a central part of any new trade agreements that are being negotiated. Thanks. Thank you very much, Director. Uh, comments from uh, Ms. Muirly? Yes, so I, I think just to briefly, briefly add, just um, on the point of um, shortening value chains, it's for us right now in the immediate recovery, it's literally about how do we, um, of course, meet our program requirements, but also how do we engage women in other vocational training and how do we um, increase demand for some of the products that they're, that they're producing. So like I mentioned before, um, in Senegal, in Mali, we've been looking at um, like face masks as well. So just in terms of COVID, but also ensuring that post COVID, they have a diverse um, portfolio of, um, of, of products that they produce, which will support you know, their income, their economic empowerment, um, whether that's on an informal basis, where it's um, cross-border training or even internally. Um, and then again, going forward, put, um, presenting incentives for being in the formal sectors. Thank you very much for that. Uh, let, let, let me say, uh, I mean, <laughs> the, the comments and the, coming from the questions and everything have been very, very rich. Uh, and I, as I said, I'm acutely aware of the time. Um, so what I would do at this point in time is to allow our four panelists to give any parting words that they would want to, to give to the audience as well. And then I would invite uh, Ambassador as well to give her uh, final remarks and also closing comments uh, as co-convener to, to the event. So at this time, I would invite our panelists, not in any particular order, um, to give your closing remarks. And then we will invite uh, Ambassador to give her uh, closing remarks um, on the event and any uh, thoughts that she may want to share as we uh, close. So the floor is open to our panel. Okay, maybe I could start with the going. Well, questions. I'll go. Oh, sorry. We're... Go ahead. Gonna... Okay, thank you. Well, I'll, I'll be brief. I'll just say, you know, I think it is very important to acknowledge where progress has been made because they provide both lessons learned and they provide guides, for, you know, they provide encouragement and um, tools and guides for the way forward. So, you know, uh, thank you very much to Amrita for sharing uh, the information about where there has been progress made, particularly in the context of trade agreements. Um, we know that there are those lessons learned out there in all areas. So I think uh, uh, it's really important for us to, to take the time. I want to take the time here to, to, celebrate, to celebrate those. And then at the same time, continuing the discussion and in fora like these is very important. So I thank you for the opportunity to participate and I look forward to continuing the fight. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. So um, the parting uh, thoughts probably are that I think it's high time that policymakers realize and acknowledge that the world economy will suffer even more if women who account for one half of the world's working age population are further excluded from the economy and hence impeded from contributing to, let's say, the post-COVID-19 economic recovery, for, for example. So placing women back at the center of economies will lead to rapid recovery, rapid economic recovery. So this recovery will put us back on track to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals, the UN 2030 Sustainable Development Goals, and we must keep that in mind. How we can work towards that, there are ways and solutions at domestic and international levels. Um, I present my, I've been researching um, the top-down approach as to how we can use international law to bring about changes at the domestic level. And I would invite and encourage uh, researchers in the session to also pursue the bottom-up approach, which is also quite effective. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Barry. Angela? 
Yes, thank you, Ambassador. So just to say thank you once more for allowing us, um, allowing me to the opportunity to be here. Um, just want to leave by, you know, saying that we really need to be intentional um, in taking policies um, from paper and actually um, realizing them in real life. And that's not just down to managers, this is down to every single individual. Um, so that means, you know, practically investing in a young woman, even if you are a junior pro program analyst, how do you take your, the lessons that you're learning and pass them down to other young women that you may be mentoring. It also means that men have to take an active role in um, supporting female colleagues, um, really demonstrating uh, male allyship, especially as this year is the year for male ally allyship. And then just on speaking on, you know, the moments that we're celebrating across 2020, it's, you know, we, we have a really unique opportunity to build on the, the work that we've previously done, but also it's important that we don't allow, um, as all the panelists have said, allow our progress to slip back. We have a really good opportunity to build back better in a way that truly leaves no one behind. So let's just build on what we've already done and, carry on the fight. Thank you very much. Director Hamilton. Uh, thank you. I don't know what more I'm supposed to say, but um, <laughs> let me just say that I'm, I'm very thankful for this opportunity. I think it's been a rich discussion. Um, clearly, we have a lot to do. What I would like to say is that we, we should use this opportunity of COVID to, to address the elephant in the room in more ways than one. I think COVID has changed a lot for everybody. Um, and the, the actual shutting down of the world, in a sense, has also brought to bear the importance of women in the working world, what the impact has been when we are, you know, not engaged uh, formally or informally. And I think I'd like to suggest that women also have um, a responsibility to, to bear in getting involved in the power structures. I think part of our problem is that we refuse and we have to take responsibility for that. I, I don't think that there's anything that prevents women from running for election in our countries. We just don't. Uh, we can go into the whys and the wherefores, but the truth is we don't. Um, I'm guilty of it, and many of us are. It's not that we're not bright. It's not that we're not articulate. It's not that we don't know the issues. It's not that we're not economists or lawyers or, you know, sir, ambassador, you know, you know. <laughs> we have brilliant, accomplished, amazing women all over the world. Why are we not sitting in parliament? And I think those are the bigger questions that we also need to begin to ask ourselves. Because no, no power structure that I know um, agrees to dismantle itself. <laughs> I haven't heard of one. If you know of one, let me know. But I don't know of any structure that willingly dismantles itself. And so we need to also be aware that we have a role to play that is more dynamic than simply talking about it, the issues and working on legal stuff. We also need to get into the power dynamic. So that's where I'll leave it. Thank you very much, Ta. And great panel, great panelists. I hope we get together soon. Thanks. Thank, thank you very much, Director, uh, for, for those, those closing remarks. And to all of you. Now, it, it really leads me to um, give the floor to my co-convener and fellow gender champion, Ambassador uh, Leader of Mexico, to give her final thoughts and comments as well. Uh, as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. It has been a very, very rich panel. I'm very grateful to all the panelists for, the, for their comments. I think we have been focusing in trade, but many times touching the more the, the dynamics of the work in a more general way. And I think it's very clear that the gender gap uh, that we are looking in trade is also part of a multidimensional phenomenon. This gender gap reflects economic dynamics, but also world dynamics at large. Uh, and it's very clear that uh, we need to move faster and better toward gender inclusive uh, policies. This is imperative for sustainable trade uh, policy. I was very much impressed at the comments made by Dr. Barry, where we have a lot of provisions uh, uh, in terms of gender in, 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 in trade treaties, but it's just good, nice words. We have to move towards enforcement. We have to move towards implementation. It's not intention, now we have to move to action. And I think this COVID-19 crisis gives us the opportunity to do that. Uh, women are half uh, of the population. They participate in the economy. Most of the time informally, we need to empower them 
to do better, to find better jobs, well-paid jobs, we have also to pay men. I just wanted to make a point because I think for many years we have been talking about how to make even the, the, the ground for, for men and women. The first uh, women conference was in 1975. And uh, we are just celebrating 25 uh, years of the Beijing platform. And we have really advanced a lot, but not enough. We have to do much more. And we need to have uh, more women participation in parliaments. I fully agree. But the only way to do that is by revising laws. I can tell you that in the case of Mexico, until we approve a law making mandatory participation of women in parliament, we achieve the 50%. Only true changes in the law. And that's, I think we have, to, we have to do more. And I think this panel has been excellent because underlines all the areas where we really need to focus. And this is, a, this is an ongoing work. It will never finish. And we have to be better coordinated and we, have be, we need to be delivering more as one. So thank you very much for this panel. Thank you very much to all the panelists. And we will, be, we will keep working. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for, for your words. And I, I completely agree with you. Uh, and, and equally, for, for my closing remarks, I would simply say, first of all, thank you to all of you um, for your very, very well thought out and comprehensive uh, look at the issues, both in terms of panelists and also the questions fielded from our participants. Um, what's clear, very, very clear, is that there has to be, um, you know, a movement from the discussion to practice. The, the time for dialogue um, must continue, but it mustn't just stay there. And one thing to, to take away from the COVID-19 reality, if I should use the climate change reality, is that within four months of COVID-19, COVID-19 has been able to achieve more for climate change and the environment in terms of the, the, the world being able to breathe than 10 years and 15 years of policy or dialogue and um, documents combined, okay? The point I'm making is sometimes you just have to take the bull by the horns, if I should use that term, uh, and just go. And as Director Court Hamilton said, no structure invariably allows itself to just dismantle. Sometimes you just have to take it and go with it. And I think that we really need to use this pandemic going forward um, as the catalyst for that. Um, and uh, the last thing I would say is that uh, whilst we talk about the future of trade uh, and inclusiveness, I think we need to look about, talk about trade and inclusiveness of the future, which is obviously a different perspective. Um, so that we move these discussions into the mainstreaming of international policy, uh, advocacy, uh, and legislation, really, so that we can have clear, measurable uh, outcomes in the shortest period of time. So I really want to say thank you to, again to the panelists, to the participants, particularly to our partners uh, who have uh, helped us to put this on. And thank you for all of, of, of the questions that we've received. And I think there's momentum going forward here. Um, equally, there's a low-hanging fruit to my mind that we should really look at. Next year, we have two major global events. Um, where we can really push this issue, particularly on the trade and development agendas. One, MC12, um, which is the ministerial for the WTO. Uh, and I think these are things that delegations who are acutely aware of these things need to lobby. And then also there's OCTAD 15, which will be held in, in Barbados. Um, and I think in both theatres, notwithstanding they're separate theatres, but still linked in many respects, these are the things that we have to be pushing uh, uh, as, as we lead towards um, these international fora and beyond, okay? So once again, thank you to all of you. Thank you for signing in, and I wish you a fantastic evening, wherever you are, a fantastic morning, wherever you are in the world. So take care, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.